So welcome everyone to this live uh, taping of our movie night podcast. Our special guest is Danya Bder, who is a Lebanese Canadian writer and director. Her first film in white 2016 was selected for the Claremont Ferdinand IFF BFI Uppsala and won the grand prize at Curta Cinema Rio de Janeiro Short Film Festival. She's a member of the Brooklyn Filmmakers Collective and has, a, and has an MFA in directing from NYU Tisch School of Arts. In 2019, she was selected as a uh, Ber Ber uh, Berlinale talent and um, participated in the short film station with her short film, Warsha. Uh, Warsha is co-produced by Gogo Films, France, and, um, and with Ne Abeirut Films. It's had its world premiere at the 2022 Sundance Festival, where it won the short film jury uh, prize in international fiction, making it eligible for the 2023 Ac uh, Academy Awards. Wadshu was also selected by IFFR in Rotterdam, BFI Flair in London, South by Southwest in Austin, and Claremont uh, Ferrand in France. Currently based in Dubai, Dania is developing her first feature film. Dania is an old friend, and I'm so excited to have her on the series. Uh, welcome to Africa, Dania. Hi, Mikey. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Big fan of Africa. Del. Very happy to finally be on it. Yeah. <laughs> finally. I've been wanting it so long, but I have actually. Well, you know, it's so funny. Um, the first time we met, which was many, many years ago, and we met through Africa, um, we were talking, I remember we were talking about somehow working together and shooting some fun, like Africa Day E type videos. And I don't know if you remember this. And mm -hmm. we were on the rooftop of, uh, of Lian Sada and Farah's rooftop. And you're like, Mikey, we could do this thing where the drone emerges from the side of the balcony and we can shoot you yeah. with a drone. <laughs> I did. I do not remember that, but it makes sense because I had just bought a drone and I'm like, I want to do something with it. And, and then what? actually on that rooftop, I flew it and I uh, broke one of the propellers. And now the drone is in my closet here in Beirut, even unused since that day. Unused. But lo and behold, you have yeah. figured out a project to use drones um, mm -hmm. in, in worship. So let's talk a little bit about... Um, your entryway into filmmaking um, and sort of the moment where you decided, oh, I'm not just gonna love movies and love film. I think I'm actually gonna make films. Mm. Um, so I come from a family of four girls and I'm the youngest and there's uh, seven years between me and the youngest one, Aya. So I pretty much grew up by myself watching a lot of TV uh, learning them by heart, watching a lot of sitcoms, shows, things, and just kind of taking it all in. And my way of entertaining myself was mostly to reenact them, uh, kind of play different roles. I loved costumes. And so I really thought what I wanted to do was be an actress. And I joined theater at school. I had like no problem being on stage. And I really thought this is it. And then at 16, uh, my dad, may rest in peace, he gifted me my first uh, video camera. And it was a pretty expensive video camera uh, for like a 15 year old. And I remember very well my mom telling him, why are you giving her this camera? She will break it and lose it. And like, she <laughs> can't you see how irresponsible she is? But, but actually that video camera was like my everything. It was a mini DV and it was really light. And I just became that person who filmed everything. I was that person in the group would you know we'd go out to uh, the movies or dream park and I would just film everything and go back home and edit it into a little uh, video and so that's when I knew that I much prefer and I enjoy the process of, of making films um, but then when it was time to apply for university I didn't really have the courage or the encouragement to to go to film school fully like that was supposed to be a hobby to be kept on the side and you know not a money maker and not a, a career and I couldn't find a film school I really loved and so I just kind of found my way into graphic design in uh, AUB at American University of Beirut and I was not a good graphic designer at all I was uh, very bad but <laughs> the AUB program is really good because it yeah. makes you um, it really roots it in the environment so our projects were not just make a logo it was go find a store in Hamra that's like broken down and 
talk to them and make a logo for them or like make a you know magazine but like do an interview with this person to design the layout so for me the four years at AUB was very much about going all around Lebanon soaking up stories and meeting people and seeing different parts and realizing that none of this was like any of the stuff I was consuming and watching on TV and like that this is really what our strength was and our our beauty and and so I think it was in my final year where I was like that's it I had visited Aya in New York and I visited NYU in Columbia and I was like this is where I need to be and and so as soon as I applied and thankfully got into NYU and so the second I graduated from AUB two months later I was on a on a plane to New York to to start my master's I, I didn't work as a designer at all yeah um so I, I want to jump right into NYU um, and your thesis project, which is in white, which we have on the screen here, which I uh, had the uh, the privilege of watching, I think, at uh, one of the earlier screenings. Um, and it is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful film. Um, viewers can found it, find it online. Uh, it's a gorgeous short film that is so touching. Um, can you just tell the audience a little bit about what it's about and what you learned in the process of, of writing and producing and sort of um, birthing and directing that film. Sure. First of all, thank you, really. It's a, it's a film that means a lot to me. It was a very personal film. Um, at that time, I wanted to make a feature, which is a long film, and um, I, for my thesis. And then as I was working on it, I realized it was a really big beast and I wasn't fully ready. So I said, okay, let me just take a section from this feature and make it as a short and it can be my proof of concept so that later I'll do the feature film. And it's it very much dealt with, so I lived in New York for five years and within those five, well now eight years, but at the time it had been like four or five years. And so within those, there's a lot of trips uh, back and forth to Lebanon. And I saw myself and felt myself change and grow and evolve um, in New York just because I'm in this new place that is so much bigger where everyone around you is being their most authentic self. Nobody's judging anyone. Nobody's looking at anyone or like there's no one way to be. And um, even as, as an Arab or as a Muslim or as a Lebanese trying to tell my story to other people, they, you know, they start asking why, why, why? And then you start realizing that a lot of the things you take for granted, you're like, why do we do this? And why do we do that? And so really a lot of New York opened me up to re-question a lot of things and redraw the person who I truly was. And that was amazing for me. But every time I came back to Beirut, I always felt a little bit of a clash with you've become so American or, you know, why are you questioning this? Or this is just the way it is. We don't ask. And like a lot of these types of conversations. And that's kind of what this film is about at, at the core of it. Um, it is about Lara, a 20 year old, uh, 25 year old uh, uh, artist living in New York, uh, who's back in Beirut for her father's funeral. And, um, and basically, once she arrives to Beirut, and it's a kind of a traditional Muslim funeral with men on one side, women on the other, uh, she first says that she wants to wear white to celebrate her dad's uh, memory. And then the mom and everyone is, of course, like, of course not. That's not what we do. There's a ritual, there's a way to do things. And then as they're there, her secret Jewish fiance appears and he's under the impression that everyone knows about him, but nobody knows about him. So the film is kind of those three days of funeral where she's stuck between the person she's become in New York and the person she was and, and trying to kind of navigate between these two worlds and really reconnect uh, to, to the person she wants to be. And it's, it's uh, there's no like clear answer for me even until now, of course, Lebanon and the Arab world and our culture gives us so much warmth and you know family and uh, sometimes these rituals are great like when I went through my dad's funeral I was very much so that's what it was inspired from the memory of my dad's funeral I was very much against how robotic it all was but in retrospect I can see that it's helpful somehow to have something to follow so you don't or else if I was left to my own I would have just fallen apart for non-stop you know five days to a month in my room so there's like pros and cons to these both of these worlds, this individualist world of, of a place like New York and this collectivist world of a place like Lebanon. And, and that's what the film is about, kind of what, how you can take your, the best of each place and not alienate or push away the rest and just kind of own that. And, yeah. and after I made the short, I felt 
I felt like I, I was, I had kind of exercised that demon and told that story. And then I decided not to do the feature anymore. I felt like it was, I didn't need her whole story of being in Beirut, moving to New York, all of that. Like it's actually that funeral captured uh, all of the emotions I wanted to get across. Yeah, the, the depth of emotion was definitely communicated. Um, and I don't think it, it was almost like a, a poem <clears throat> insofar as um, I don't think it needed more space. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I encourage everyone to, to go to uh, watch in white online. It's really, really uh, powerful. So today's movie night is supposed to be about Warshi. Um, so Let's talk a little bit about what this um, this movie is in brief. Hadla will will show the trailer. Um, I would imagine that most people watching haven't seen this yet, um, but it's going to be widely available um, in Shadla very soon. So let's uh, talk a little bit about from your perspective. When did you start making this movie in your head? Um, it started in uh, 2017, I believe I was, so I had done in white, it had done well, and I had felt like, okay, now I'm ready for a feature, no more shorts, I think like I'm ready for the big games, and so I wasn't planning on making another short, it was not really in my mind at all, but I was in Lebanon at the time, I was in the mountains on the balcony, and I was writing, you know, whatever my next feature was going to be. And I look up and I see um, a man standing on top of a crane. And at first I got really scared because I thought he was going to jump. And I kept watching him. And then I realized as he kneeled down and, and put his forehead to the ground that he was actually praying. And that sight just kind of really got stuck in my head and it was so beautiful. And I realized you know, that we see cranes all the time, all around and especially Lebanon at the time was like obsessed with like rebuilding itself, giving itself facelifts. And you know, sort of plenty of cranes and luxury buildings. And, but we never really think about that little person who's in that little cabin, this, this uh, person who can, who's operating this huge machine and who can see the world, but nobody can see him. And, and so that's kind of where the genesis of the, of the film, where I was like, I wanna make a film about a crane operator. I had, I had a scene in my mind of, of him getting on a ladder and, and, you know, climbing up and just progressively seeing the difference in landscape as you leave that world behind and you go up above there in your throne. Um, but I didn't know much about what it was going to be. I, at the time, there was a new song and new music video that dropped by a, a new artist called Hansa. And he, I loved the music video and I loved the song. It was so kind of uh, daring and beautiful and, and already was tackling masculinity and, and uh, the definition of masculinity and femininity and questioning kind of what art form belongs to which gender and you know actually rejecting that it you know one belongs to one and so then he had a concert and I went to watch him live it was a concert but also a dance performance an art performance beautiful in metro in Medina and that's when I was blown away he was just kind of oscillating between feminine, masculine, dancing, belly dancing, singing, had a hairy torso, just like taking everything in. And at some point he just loses you as an audience and you don't even know what you're watching, if it's a man or a woman and you don't care. It's just breathtakingly beautiful and transcendental. Yeah. So after that uh, performance, he and I started talking. We didn't know each other at all. I just went up to him like a fan. Oh my God, I love what you do. I'm a filmmaker. I invited him to a screening of In White at the time and he came and loved it as well. And then that's when we just kind of started uh, talking for a long, long time. And I told him I had this idea for a crane operator film. And then together, that's when we were like, what if what this crane operator wants to express up there is some, something, something artistic that he can't really express in his daily life. And, uh, and so that's when it was born. It was very short, close to each other, that first crane operator moment and Hansa. And so he's been there from the beginning and it yeah. took like you know, this whole this time to make it happen. Amazing. So let's watch a little bit of the trailer. And for those who don't speak Arabic, Warshim means construction site um, and is very much uh, a perfect, perfect name. Okay, let's watch the trailer. This should be short.
Okay, very short. So let's um, let's talk a little bit about the the making of of the film. Um, and this might be a, a stupid question, but who were you who were you sort of making the film for? You think? So that other picture you just showed, I just have to give a disclaimer so yeah. people don't think I'm a, an idiot. Well, I was in Ray in the beginning, with that's when we got into Berlinale and we were trying to like still make the film happen. And I just photoshopped yeah. this. I am very aware that the scale is wrong and that this human would not fit <laughs> in that cabin. And I was just trying to make it dramatic and, you know, and, and I kind of hate that this photo is all over the internet now because I feel like some people see it and they're like, oh, that, that's not going to look good. <laughs> and it's, it's not. Who is this film. 25 foot construction worker that you have? <laughs> exactly. And I like really, but now you can tell how bad of a designer I was. Look, I deleted the boat from under the sun and you can see that like stamping of, of the whatever, whatever. <laughs> So uh, it's important to know this is not in the film. If anything, the other shot is from the film. And it's a bit yeah. of a spoiler, but it's, uh, I'll allow it. Um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about um, who, who you were sort of making the, the film for. And if that question is stupid, tell me why it's stupid. Um, it's stupid. I mean, it's stupid is a strong word, but I, I wouldn't say I'm making the film for someone at, at the beginning, at least. Like, I'm just thinking I'm dying to make this film. I'm just thinking the story would be so beautiful. You know, you're getting really into the character. You start building who it is. Me and Hansa together, we are building who this character is. His name is Muhammad. He's Syrian. He's a construction worker. What his backstory was, you know, um, how can we give, give off the feeling of his daily life and how claustrophobic it is, how, you know, construction workers um, um, are often in Lebanon, Syrian, undocumented, underpaid, like it's not, um, uh, you know, prestigious job by any sense. And they tend to all come together. So this idea of privacy as well, like you're sharing a house, you're sharing a van, you're sharing a workplace. And so that's kind of what was appealing about this idea of the of this cabin. And what would you do with, with this kind of privacy where nobody can see you? And so throughout making the film, we're just thinking, me and all of my creative team, whether it's the DP, Shadi Shaban, big shout out to him, he's amazing, and everyone else who kind of poured their heart into this film, we're just thinking about how we can express the emotion and the arc of this character in the best ways we can. And then when it's kind of released out into the audience is, of course, I have idea in my mind of who I think would like it. Like you can say there are some queer themes. So like these people might like it. People who care about, you know, migrant workers, white also might can. But what's nice about releasing it is that everyone has a, such a personal relationship to it. So some people tell me it was an ode to Lebanon and I didn't really have that in mind when I made it. Some other people would tell me, you know, it's reminded me of feeling claustrophobic during lockdown and then wanting to be just out. So it, it's who it's for yeah. becomes apparent after it's out really. And that's the best part of sharing the film because at first you're just kind of like putting in um, what you what you want it to be, but then it's, it's, uh, it's out there. Yeah. Um, how the hell did you shoot this? <laughs> how, did you make, like, how did you make like this movie? <laughs> I felt like that was going to be the question in that way, Nessa, Kevin, how the hell did you shoot this? Um, so when we came up with the idea and we wanted to shoot it and everything, we got very excited, you know, and you're spitballing with your friends and you're getting creative. The sky's the limit, right? And literally, quite literally, the yeah, the quite literally yeah. yeah. And so one of the things that Khansa does as, a, as an art form is he does aerial uh, dance, aerial performance, and he specializes in chains. So that felt so perfect for a for the film as well. And then you yeah. start thinking like, what if you're in the cabin and what if you're hanging off the crane and what if, you know, in that moment, it's just amazing. And you're high giving ideas and everything. And then comes the like, okay, how the hell are we gonna make it in a reality? And that's where, thank God for every director, there's a producer. And so the producer on this film, the main producer was Kohali Diaz, uh, French. I met her in a film festival in France when I was um, presenting in white. And I had to, uh, the year after that, I went again and I had told her about Wersha and she had never produced a film. She had worked on production companies and like been, you know, in other uh, roles, but this was going to be her first short ever. And lo and behold, she happened to pick the most complicated, ambitious story within the most complicated country that had the most eventful four years you know, even within the eventful four years globally of like pandemic and stuff. So it was very hard to make this film a reality. And 
I didn't make her life easy. At the beginning, I was like, I want authenticity and I need, you know, I need everything to be in my way. And I want it to be up there in the crane. I want to be up there in the cabin. It's your job to figure out how the hell we're going to make it happen. Like if you want to build the trampoline underneath, if you want to build the platform up there, you know, that's yeah. on you. I'm just the one with the creative ideas. Um, and then, in, and she kept telling me like, it's going to be crazy. It's impossible. I'm like, no, no, I'm sure you'll figure out a way. And I just kept dreaming. Uh, and then in, in 2018, we wanted to shoot a teaser so that we can fundraise for the film. So kind of, you know, show it around, submit it to grants and, and try and tell these people, this is what we're working with or, you know, here, what do you think? And um, so we went, me and Khamsa and a camera operator, Mazen Hashem, and we shot a few shots in the construction site and that was all cool. And then when it was time to shoot the shots in the cabin, the uh, Mazen, the uh, camera operator, who knew very well what the plan was going to be, just froze. He just like looked up there as like the time we we crossed the bridge and looked up at the ladder to, that you actually have to get on because there's no other way to get up there. He just froze and he's like, um, you know what, Danya, I have kids. Uh, he, he just like, he gave me the video camera and he's like, good luck. I really hope you get what you need. There's, I'm sorry, there's no way I'm going to, I'm going up there. And so I was like, I have to, I have to go up there. I have to get these shots. So I put the camera in my backpack and, you know, Khamsa is kind of like a monkey. So he's just like, all right, let's go. And he's just it's super fine. He wanted to actually do the aerial performance really up there with no, with no security. He's like, this is my job as a performer. It's a stunt. And if you die on stage, it's part of your story. I'm like, hell no, you're not dying on my film. So I thought I was being the mature one, but I wanted to also shoot everything up there. And anyway, so he went up the ladder super easily. And I thought I'd be fine. I love heights usually. I skydived, I bungee jumped, I seek that thrill. But the second I got in that ladder space, it was kind of something more powerful than me. It just got, I got vertigo. I felt like everything was blurry and I felt lightheaded and I really had to like focus on Danya put your hands on those bars and focus and like one hand above the other, one step after the other and really not look down at all because you realize in that latter moment how vulnerable you are, like how there's really nothing there. And so we got up, we realized I was, I shot my moments, but I realized how tiny the cabin was, you know, even with the camera, if I just want to do this a little bit, I could fall to my death. And so really it was that day that I called the producer and I was like, all right, you're right. Maybe we can't shoot this in real life. Uh, let's start thinking of another way. Um, I don't know if you have time to show the teaser. I think it gives a little bit of that uh, feeling, but um, let's, if not, we can share the link. We'll, we'll save the teaser uh, towards the end, but let's talk about the other way. Let's talk about this technology that you implemented, um, which is called Unreal Engine. Um, if I'm getting that correct, so walk us through exactly what Unreal Engine is and this sort of methodology, um, this technology. So uh, Unreal Engine is, uh, is kind of started as a gaming technology. And uh, then they started to use it like, oh, this could be really good for films. And one of the first people who used it was, um, I'm completely blanking on his name. You would probably know, but uh, executive producer of The Mandalorian, uh, Favreau, John Favreau. Yeah. John Favreau, um, yeah. Yes, exactly. So they did it on uh, on the Mandalorian, and it was revolutionary because the idea is, it's a virtual production studio. Uh, you have an LED wall curved almost 360. I think it's about 280 degrees, floor to ceiling, very very high quality, um, and you also have even the screen on the ceiling. And when you're making a film like the Mandalorian, you know you have like some kind of uh, you're on another planet or whatever. And so you have your actors there and then you have all that background and you can even add 3D elements and all that stuff. And for a film like Wersha, where obviously we couldn't actually get a whole crew to climb that ladder or to any way to make it uh, safe, what we did is we, um, we flew a dro drone in Lebanon at the height of a crane, at the height of the cabin. And we took 360 images, high quality images, at different times of day, like uh, sunrise, sunset, noon, you know, all the days that we were kind of gonna use. And we sent those over to the post-production house, which is called La Planète Rouge, which is the red planet in French. Um, 
Kohali found them. They told us about this technology. I was really, at first, before that, all I knew was green screen. And I'm like, oh, I really don't want to direct a scene in a green room. I don't want to have to tell Khansa to imagine Beirut. I don't want to have to like, you know, direct blind. That's what I, I was yeah. afraid of because I had only directed on, on location before that. And so the, the founder of the company, uh, Lionel, was telling me, check this out. Look what they did on the Lorian liquid. You can do, you can actually see everything in camera. I was blown away. And, and first, it was kind of a problem that they weren't going to have, they were building it themselves and they weren't going to have it ready in time for our shoot. But then because of COVID and 2020, everything stopped and we had to postpone. They actually had the time to finish building it out. And we were, we shot two days after they like put in their last brick or whatever yeah. is the equivalent for a, a screen like that. And um, it was a great opportunity to shoot there because, so we shot the drone 360 images. We sent those over to France. They input them, they stitch them together and input them into the uh, screen. And I even had the liberty to be like, I don't like Sama Beirut. Can we get that? Can we get rid of that? Yeah. Like it's too, it's too high. It's making it seem like my crane isn't high enough. Let's like delete that. I don't like that crown, uh, that cloud. Let's get rid of it. So you have this power. And then we brought uh, an actual cabin that we found in France. We had to elevate it so that you know you don't see the ground because the ground is not uh, LED. And then so anywhere you put the camera, you're seeing the actor and you're seeing Beirut behind him. And even for Khansa, he when he goes up there and he sees the view for the first time, he doesn't have to imagine out, yeah. out of looking at something green. He's actually seeing um, you know the mosque and downtown and the sea, and he can remember reconnect to the emotion he had when he actually went up on a crane. And for me and the DP, me and Shadi, we're looking on screen and we're getting all these ideas like, oh, what if we get a reflection shot where we get this? So it's, it's really the feeling of being on location and having access to something that's usually dangerous. But even though we felt like we were in Lebanon, even though we we're in the middle of like, south of France, yeah. uh, it was an incredible opportunity. So it's a, it's, a tool, it's a tool for the filmmakers. It doesn't enhance necessarily the experience of the audience, the end product of the experience for the audience, but it's like an in- it's like a, it's like almost like a magic viewfinder where you're like, the way okay. it enhances The way it enhances the experience for the audience is that it looks damn real. Mm. There's no, you know, green uh, taking out your character and then putting yeah. a, a, a background instead and then trying to like delete the green behind, between the hairs. And, and that's sometimes what gives the audience the feeling of like, oh, that looks, uh, that looks fake. You know, like when you see a bad Photoshop. Thanks, yeah. Farah. Um, so it just feels real, it looks real. And from a cinematography standpoint, usually when you shoot in a green screen, the light from the green is also like leaks onto the character and you have to do a lot of color correcting and, and you know, yeah. try and find ways for it not to show. Whereas in this, like when we were shooting Sunset, the uh, Hansa was already lit with, uh, with the, the orange the glow colors. of Sunset. Yeah. yeah, the GP just had to add a little bit of light here and there, but it, you're in the environment, you feel it. Okay, I want to go back to the idea of the sort of the themes. Um, how did you uh, how did you navigate the very tricky terrain of entering into a world that you're not a part of, right? And trying to tell the story of a community that of which you're not a part at all. It's it's like a very delicate a delicate thing to say. Like I know I know the emotions that they're going through. Um, construction workers in Beirut, I can, I can tap into that. Like, how did you unpack that problem and try to approach it? Because I know that you are somebody who's really uh, deliberate about this type of stuff and takes this type, type of stuff really seriously. So how did you approach that? Yeah, for sure. It's, it's a really good question. And it's actually very tricky, especially more and more these days with the conversation being who has the right to tell the story because there's a line where it's like 100% you cannot just like come and just take someone's story and then you know run with it and, and not give anything to the community like there's a responsibility that you have and at the same time the the point of film and cinema and acting is playing pretend is taking on a role is writing a fiction like that not everyone can make a film exactly about their experience and can be limited to only that so it's a very tricky thing because I find myself being upset when like you know, a white American just like comes and takes a story about Beirut and, you know, hires a bunch of Americans and then goes and shows it over there. And, and I get really upset, like, how dare you? But at the same time, obviously I am not a construction worker, as you said, and all that stuff. 
Um, so on one hand, what I think is, well, on one hand, on a personal level, I'm also Syrian. I, my parents are both Syrian and, you know, my family, my culture is very much Syrian. And I have felt the feeling of, you know, growing up in Beirut, having a Syrian accent um, and, you know, Lebanese people and like, you know, teenagers, kids are just brutal with catching. Even the difference is so small between these two countries that are so close to each other. Yeah, but ben, the language... Ben Warsha or Warsha. Exactly. Warsha, Warsha. I'm going to say Bab, Fasulia. Yeah, Fasulia. Lots of teasing happened. And I really worked on myself to like get that accent out so that I wouldn't uh, feel that. And, you know, Lebanon and Syria have a big um, history and it's kind of uh, love hate is kind of uh, complicated. There's the political stuff, there's the neighbor stuff. Like workers have been coming to work in Lebanon, construction workers through Syria for ages. But, you know, there's always this like, there's a rejection and, a, and an attraction between these two places. And I've always felt it already belonging to these two cultures. Like people in Lebanese, or, you know, Lebanon would be, would start saying like, I can't hate, I can't stand the Syrians. And because my accent's not there anymore, they wouldn't know that, you know, I'm one of the persons they're referring to, or like they wouldn't censor themselves. So those are definitely things I felt. Um, and then when it comes to be working in construction, it's a lot, it was a lot of research. I spent a lot of time, a friend of mine, Hamad Ghutme, who was an engineer and works on construction sites, he took me many times to construction sites where we would meet people and talk to people and just kind of gather as many stories as possible. Um, I think part of the responsibility of filmmaking when you're making a film that's not your own is to include a lot of the people in the filmmaking process. So it's like, we are all telling the story together. I'm using my skill, which is the cinematic language, but like the, the extras in the film, all the extras in the film are all construction workers that we met in one of our uh, site visits. The two uh, secondary characters, actors, are Syrian actors as well, who I gave him a script with like, this is kind of what I want the message to be, but please say it in your way, like what feels natural. So they wrote their own lines and they improvise their own lines. And that's how it becomes a collective uh, telling of the story. Same thing with Khansa. He brought his own experience of Muhammad. He relates to what it feels like to grow up in a very masculine world um, that does not appreciate art or feminist, uh, f uh, feminine types of art as well within a, a man's world. And he had to really always run and find these moments where he could express himself freely and where he could, he could be himself. So he poured of himself into the character. I poured myself into the character. We gathered from everyone around us. And then also having great producers like Pierre Sarraf is a Lebanese co-producer from Nea Beirut. And he brought Marilyn Nasrallah to be the line producer. And she put together the Lebanese crew. She read the script. And she started handpicking each person from the casting director to the production assistant to be like, read the script. I think you're gonna love it. And they did. So a lot of members from the LGBT community and allies who felt strongly about this uh, film then also joined part of the crew. And, and that's when it, it felt like it was this aligning and it creates magic in that sense yeah. because no one's you know, doing a job for job's sake. No one's just like, you know, um, doing what they need to do and leaving, we're all pouring ourselves into the film. And I hope that it comes across when you watch it, because I, I feel like it, um, you know, through different fields of cinema, it's, it's a little bit of that. And even when people watch it, they've been telling me, you know, that they interpret it, it makes them feel something differently. You're frozen. Am I, am I frozen? No, no, I hear okay, you good. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, it becomes personal. That's when it becomes scary, when you let it out and you're like, okay, yeah. I hope I didn't fuck this up. I hope I was sensitive. I hope, you know, I'm not stepping on any toes and I can go down to what I do best or what I try to do best is just the emotion. Yeah. Capture the emotion, translate the emotion. And then that's, that's universal. Okay, so I have one last question before we move on to the, the films of note. Um, rapid fire stuff. How does it feel to win a bunch of awards for this type of stuff, namely at Sundance? <laughs> It feels amazing. It feels incredible. I mean, just getting yeah. selected at the Sundance, which is the first festival we submitted to and we had as our like goal. 
um, we submitted a work in progress, the, the VFX wasn't done yet and everything. And just receiving that email with like, congratulations, you were selected was I think one of the happiest days of my life. I screamed and yelled from the, the, from the bottom of my heart. It's a festival that's so known and so prestigious and so like um, uh, unreachable, unattainable, you know, uh, goal usually. And they have such a competitive, uh, film selection process where like a short film I think it's like 0.5 percent chance of getting in so I was so happy and then I was so disappointed where they decided to make it virtual because of um, uh, <laughs> let's say oxymoron obviously I forgot it the <laughs> oxycon whatever yeah. <laughs> one one of those coronaviruses that was really like being annoying in that period so I had to experience Sundance from my uh, guest bedroom in Dubai in my pajama bottoms, which I you can see that. them when, <laughs> when I got the award. Uh, and then, yeah, so when, when they, the, towards the end of the festival, when they emailed me and they said, can we get on a Zoom? We have some good news. I just had this little tingle and I was like, oh Amazing. my God, like you don't want to get your hopes up, but it might be that. So I just put out a shirt, kept my pajamas on and, uh, and, and said, just in case I'm going to record this uh, yeah. reaction. <laughs> So funny. Okay, let's do films of note because we're running uh, we're running a little late. Okay, so I asked you ahead of time to choose a bunch of films. We have some cute questions and we'll go through them quickly. So the film that most influenced uh, what is she? You chose. Taste of Cement, yes. So in, in general, Wadisha is one of my the films that least use other films as inspiration because it, the story was all there and there wasn't much that I had seen that was similar. But Taste of Cement is a, is a documentary by a Syrian director called Ziad Kulthum, beautifully shot, observational doc, so no interviews with anyone, just kind of a camera, a camera present with uh, Syrian construction workers building a luxury building in Lebanon. So it was inspiring because of the way it was shot and of the way you can feel and get to know the characters and the actors, even without them speaking to the camera. I highly recommend it for anyone who, who has a chance to watch it. The film you most, uh, you really loved as a kid. Amélie Poulain is the film that made me want to be a director. So I was, uh, I was watching it, I was blown away. And then as soon as it ended, you know, we had the DVDs back in the day, we had those yeah. DVDs and you could go and click bonus features. And so I watched the making of, I had never cared before. And I was like, wow, that looks fun to create the world. I love, I still love the film and a great Amazing. music as well. The film that is so underrated. That was a hard one. I don't know if it's very underrated. I think everyone likes it. Everyone loves it, I'm sure. But I feel like it's underrated from a script writing and like craft as a story and the way the story is told. It's really good. Like I study the script. I've looked at it and studied it for my current script, even though completely different, not an animation, not a, it's just really well told in, in how you can get across uh, a character arc. You know, sure. it's beautiful. Okay. A film that film students must watch. Mother, it's it's not on the big ones. Uh, I mean, it's not on the more famous ones like Citizen Kane and whatever, but it's a Korean film. Um, I don't want to make a mistake. I think it's the same director as Parasite, I believe so. Um, beautifully done, beautiful cinematography, incredible uh, story of, the, of a mother who does whatever she can for her kids. It's even non-film students, everyone should watch it. The film that always makes you laugh. The mean Girls, hands down, Tina Fey. Tina Fey. Uh, yeah, exactly. The lines from that film we will continue forever to be using and repeating uh, yeah. with each other. What was it, October 7th? Is it October 7th? Something. <laughs> I love that film. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 the quote I always quote from this film is always like, stop making, trying to make fetch happen. Yeah, it's and, right, yeah. And I don't know if it's like part of the vernacular anymore, but I still say it, but. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, the film that you rewatch all the time. Um, it's lagging for me, I'm guessing it's West Beirut, is it? It's West Beirut, yeah. Yeah, West Beirut. I have watched it 5,000 million trillion times. And if it comes on TV, I will watch it. And if it's like, uh, you know, someone tells me, let's go watch it, I'll watch it. I if I can succeed to make a film like West Beirut, I would call my, I would consider it successful, or consider myself successful as a filmmaker. Uh, 
Yeah. It's Lebanon, it's universal, it's funny, it's sad, it's uh, it's personal, uh, just incredible film. Doesn't yeah. get, doesn't age, even though it's it's been a while now that it's out. Yeah. Um, the films that have your favorite scripts, you've chose two, Separation and Lady Bird. Yeah, a Separation for Azhar Farhadi is a genius at building and concocting these like really tightly woven stories where you realize things after and you never know, not predictable at all. You never know what, you, you know, as you're watching, you're like, is that person right? Is that person right? So that's like a beautiful craft. I like Lady Bird in terms of dialogue and, and relationship, like a mother-daughter relationship there was yeah. very well captured as a, as a script and written by Greta Gerwig. Yeah. Um... A film that is most beautifully shot. Uh, that's also a really tough one, usually, because there's so many good ones for yeah. different reasons. Uh, Grande Bellezza, yes, Paolo Sorrentino. Um, it's, not a, it's not for everyone in terms of a film, because it's not a typical plot, and there's no like something specific to follow. But it is a visual experience, beautiful, with amazing music. OK, and then the last Remind one is- me of it reminds me of Beirut. If anyone watches it, let me know if you agree, but it feels like the high society of Beirut and like this, you know, extreme, extremeness. So this one is the films that most change the way you think. I don't, this is not the hunt that I meant. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> no, the hunt is a, a Scandinavian film. Um, it's not, okay, this is not the hunt. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm not gonna mess it up, but uh, Paradise Now, uh, changed how I think um, both of them not this is not the hunt but the hunt and paradise now change how I think because they go into they follow a protagonist that you would not usually you would usually judge or you would not usually think like paradise now is, is suicide bombers so usually you're like what the hell and then the hunt uh, was someone who's um, who supposedly allegedly is uh, um uh, sexual uh, molester and so uh, it's that's how they, these are the films that when you watch it you realize at the end of it like ah oh, I've changed my mind about something or I've seen something differently now okay cool okay we're going to do the standard quick q and a I'll try to go through these quickly so we have questions from the audience what are you watching right now um well the favorite thing I've been watching was Succession I love it and but it's over now so what I've uh, what I just finished was uh, We Crashed which was about the story of WeWork not a great well-made series but a crazy story and then it's even crazier that it's a real yeah. true story about WeWork yeah who would you love to shadow for a day past or present um I completely, I, you know, I had thought about this and I forgot what I wrote. Um, who would I love to shadow for a day? Damn, this is why you sent it to us beforehand, right? It's a while ago <laughs> now, I forgot. Uh, okay, we can skip it. Okay, oh. quick, skip it. Let's see, let's see if I can make it up. What yeah. do people most misunderstand about your work? I mean, thank, I haven't done that much work. I've done like a couple of shorts and well, but let me, let me Let me change the question. What do your friends or your family most misunderstand about what you do? That is, that is a better way of saying it. Um, well, first of all, a lot of them call me producer. I'm not a producer. It's such a different hat. Uh, producers are the, like the business people of a of, uh, of film. They're creative, of course, but they're the ones who have to like make it a reality. And um, uh, yeah, I don't think there's a lot of understanding in general about what it takes to write a script. Like uh, sometimes I'm writing now a feature and people are like, are you done? And it's like, no, it's a four year process. And they're like, why would it take four years? Even when show, it's 15 minutes long. They're like, why the hell did it take you five years? So people don't, what they want to understand the most is how long it takes to really make a good uh, film and how many people are involved and how much money it costs and all of that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Outside of your profession, whose work inspires you? Um, so photographers usually, uh, mostly, Leb there's a couple of Lebanese photographers that I love. Uh, one is Miriam Boulos, and I'm sure a lot of people know her, and if you don't, you should have to check out her work. So raw, so like, she captures people's souls, I feel, um, which is very rare. And then there's also Natalina Kash, 
La Ash, who does uh, exposés like about beauty in Lebanon, domestic workers in Lebanon, and that also kind of tells the story through photos. Um, and I like like an artist and performer like Hansel, who tells the whole story, you know, with music, of course, he inspires me for sure. He has a performance on Thursday in Ballroom Blitz, if you're in Beirut, check it out. And there's like tech artists and new media artists like uh, Refik Anadol, for example, he's Turkish and he's just like, I like things that transport you. Cool. Um, okay, great. So let's open it up to the questions. Before, um, before we have that question, I have one last thing uh, to ask you about uh, Warshin, which is um, if you were to have started the project today, um, it, or let me say it differently, if you had delayed working on the project and you had just started it now, do you think you would have ended up writing a different project, writing a different script? Can you hear me? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I muted because there was sound and I couldn't unmute. Um, so my initial response was going to be no, but then I realized that Lebanon has changed so much in the past four years. And we even shot in 2020 after the explosion, like we shot in April 2020 in Beirut. So that was a few months after the explosion. So though, even when those things were happening, at many times I was going to give up on what show. I was going to be like, this is not April the time. April 2021. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, 2021, I meant. Yeah. So it was a few months after the explosion. Um, you know, you start feeling like this is not the time, this is not sensitive, you know. Then I started wondering, should I incorporate the explosion into the film? Should I incorporate the port? Should I like, you know, it should also say this, it should also say fuck the politicians, it should also say this. And, you know, that's that's one of the things that would have made it much more difficult if I was going to make it now, because it's writing a script is extremely uh, emotional and personal, even for me, uh, especially for me. So it's, you have to be in a certain headspace. Like at some point I was working on a, uh, with a group of people on a series about revolution and I was writing a film about the beautiful feeling of Thawra and of like, you know, how it brought us all together. And then while that period, so many things changed that I, I looked at the script and I'm like, I don't feel this way anymore. So I can't really uh, yeah. tell the story this way anymore. I had to put it aside and you have to take, give things time to, to cook and simmer and look back at them. Yes. Okay, we have two questions, one from Sahar and one from Farah and then another one from Pia. So the first one is, what surprised you about what it takes to be a good filmmaker? Um, I don't know if it's uh, surprising. I mean, the first thing I think of is one of the most important things to be a good filmmaker is uh, being a good listener and not, being, not having too much ego, not having too much... Uh, uh, competition, not having too much uh, pride, because every film is a preparation for your next. No film is perfect. Like I watch Wesha now and I can identify a million problems. Same for In White. And when I made my first short film at NYU, it was called um, Kaleidoscope Mishkal. I had so much pressure on myself. I was in this amazing university. Some people had done Sundance with their first films. Like I had this pressure. And then when it, it didn't turn out the way I wanted it and wasn't the quality that I wanted, I was so devastated. And it was a professor who told me like, it's, it takes time, it's a work in progress. So really what it takes is a, is a thick skin and resilience and, and, and a, an ear to listen what didn't really work. Cause what you're doing as a filmmaker is you're trying to communicate. To people so if i want this to be funny and like no one's laughing i should you know take that in to for my next film um farah asks where can we watch this Warsha movie <laughs> very good question well the first thing to do is to follow it on instagram it's Warsha short film and that's where we post because now we're touring the world with festivals and that's really the best situation to watch the film is on a big screen with a good sound design and everything. And I know that Farah lives in LA and there's a screening coming up in Palm Springs Shorts Festival and in Outfest. Both of these are in June. Uh, so that'll be a good chance to watch it. If you're in San Francisco, it's also gonna be in San Fran. But um, generally, uh, you can follow on Warsha short film. If you're in the Arab world, it has to be a bit later because we have to premiere it at a uh, at an Arab festival first, and then we can start showing it to other places. But in general, if you really want to watch it and uh, send me a message, and if it, there isn't a good screening coming up nearby, I might share the link 
hopefully later we can sell it to a platform or something. But first stage, we're doing the festival route. Cool. Uh, Pia asks, what's the topic for your next film? Um, um, I am writing a feature. It takes place in Beirut. Um, in kind of my university days, that's the, what I'm inspiring from it. It's during election period. Uh, the topic is, uh, it's kind of a feisty female AUB student who's going around the city, you know, fighting patriarchy everywhere it expresses itself. And then she's still- What could this possibly be based on? Yeah, exactly, right? Totally who you're thinking. <laughs> what a fictional <laughs> character, Danya. Listen, everything is, all our films have us somewhere. Us, our families, our mother, our brother, our uncle, our neighbor. I tell my friends, you know, you being friends with me, anything you say can and will be used in a film one day. It's kind of like an unwritten contract. So I take it all in. She's feisty. She's fighting patriarchy. And then one day she stumbles upon the underground community of pigeon wars, which in Arabic means kash hamim. You might not know about it. It's a beautiful world, uh, kind of hobby, and it's very male dominated and she wants to conquer the skies. So the general themes are also masculinity, femininity, sexism, patriarchy, but also politics in Lebanon and family. And, you know, I'm trying to interweave all of these things uh, together. Amazing. Okay. You went to Tish. There is another famous uh, filmmaker who went to Tish, um, whose work also is about society um, and interweaves humor and drama um, and is a, a famous Tish grad who also acts in most of his films, um, writer, director. So when are you going to make a Dani uh, Bader joint like Spike Lee and actually star in your films as well? <laughs> Spike Lee, well, he was my professor in my second, year, third year, and he actually gave me a grant for In White. I, uh, one of the ways really? I made that film, oh, yeah, one of the ways I made that film is I won the Spike Lee production grant. Um, he's a really, really cool guy. I do not think I will be acting in any of my films. I might Why do a not? cameo. Because I wanted to be an actress when I was younger, but then when I realized what it means, like the art form and the craft it takes to be an actor, it's a hard work. I don't think I'm cut out for it. Um, I could do, you know, play a little fun thing, but I'll leave the acting for the actors. I challenge this, Danya. I, <laughs> I, I think that's a, I, I don't think that um, that's a convincing answer. Okay. No. Um, well, I'm really excited that you uh, are on um, and uh, shared your story with us. Is there anything else that people should look for or check out before we go? Um, definitely follow us on Instagram and on Facebook. It's Wersha Short Film. We put a lot of behind the scenes. We share where it's going to be showing next. We share like media and interviews with people. And also um, the fact that we won Sundance means that we are eligible for the 2023 Oscars. So right now that's the goal. And it's not an easy route. Um, it needs some money to create a PR campaign. It needs to create buzz. We need to kind of organize screenings and try and get voting Academy members to vote for it. So it really needs a buzz. And that I can, you know, anyone watching, it will be helpful when you follow on Instagram, when you share it, when you talk about the film, we get a lot of followers. And then one day down the line, if I decide to do a little funding campaign for the PR campaign, maybe you can donate or maybe you can, you know, share it to people who might donate. Because it's uh, now that we're talking to publicists, we're realizing it's a whole beast of its own. So that's the goal. Next, inshallah, Oscar. Inshallah. Well, Dania, thanks so much for being here. Uh, I'm so excited about this project and future projects. I can't wait to see what's next. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Mikey. This was fun. Okay, everyone, this is going to go up on our podcast and up on YouTube tomorrow. So uh, help spread the word about the film. If you enjoyed this, you can share the YouTube link or the podcast tomorrow. All right, everybody, take care. And tomorrow we're going to be back actually with one of Dania's friends, Munya, uh, with another movie night. So Ooh. you can watch that tomorrow as well. All right, everyone. Yeah. See ya. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, Mikey. Thanks, everyone.